Hi and welcome. I'm Darcy Crow, Senior Investment Advisor at Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management, and this is my colleague and fellow Senior Investment Advisor, Kathy Sager. Thank you so much for being here with us today. So this is our fifth installment of our Ask the Expert webinar series. The hope is that this is educational and informative content for you to empower you in your daily lives and help you make those smart financial decisions going forward. So today we're going to be discussing a topic that comes up really frequently with clients, and that is how to ensure we keep the family cabin, or if you're on the East Coast, cottage in the family. This is certainly a topic that can be very stressful for families in their planning, so it's really important to address it. Today, we're lucky we have Sally Dennis joining us again. Um, Sally is an experienced advisor on all aspects related to the transfer and protection of wealth, including estate planning, um, business succession, practice that includes trusts, wills, uh, corporate reorgs, shareholder agreements, etc. So lots and lots of experience and knowledge here. Sally joined us for our first episode of Ask the Expert, in which we covered uh, blended families and the impact on inheritances and joint ownership. And I've had a lot of, of compliments on that episode, Sally. A lot of people really got value from watching that. So if you haven't had a chance to watch, then please feel free to do so. Um, so we're, we're lucky to have you back again. Thank you. And uh, we're happy to have you share your insights about keeping the family cabin or cottage in the family. I'm very pleased to be here both, uh, and I apologize for the rather ghostly appearance I seem to have taken on. I don't <laughs> really know what to do about it, so forgive me. I look absolutely horrific. The lighting is clearly not good here. So. <laughs> but onward and upward, the show must go on. Technology issues of 2020, that's okay. <laughs> Uh, fantastic. So we want to cover a few topics today. I think we really want to talk about some of the challenges that you see, maybe some of the different strategies, planning strategies that you make use for clients and some of the advice that you might might give clients because you obviously uh, see this a lot in your estate planning with your, your clients. Sally, a very basic question. When we talk about keeping the cabin in the family, what are we actually saying? What do we mean? Well, how I interpret it is it's this desire that families often have to um, preserve the legacy of happy family holidays or so on through a property that they own. So the idea is, you know, that a cabin at Whistler, the place on Salt Spring, wherever it might be, tends to be somewhere where a family's had happy memories uh, with their children. And their desire is uh, that future generations of the family will also continue to enjoy the property. It's one way of encapsulating a sense of family, uh, a sense of belonging. So that's how I typically interpret it when people say, how do I keep my cabin in the family? Okay, fantastic. I think that's a, a, a great overview and, and the feeling that a lot of people do have. Um, I, I think we know there's a lot of challenges. You know, I myself have had personal experience. We recently have gone through that with our in-laws family cabin. Um, so Tell us all about that, Darcy. <laughs> <laughs> we'll save that for the next episode. But, um, but certainly there's a lot of challenges and there's a lot of emotions that go into that. And it's a very, very emotional experience for people given the, the connection and the memories that they have. So can we talk about just some of the challenges that you see when we are trying to treat that family cabin as a, as a legacy asset? No, absolutely. And, and you're absolutely correct in saying that it is highly emotional and very stressful. And and whenever it comes up in my estate planning discussions with families, I, I wait for it. And there's always that, uh oh, here we go. Because uh, very often people care far more about this topic than than many others, including you know actual money and who's going to have the wealth. They're, they're far more concerned about this and find it very stressful. And the reason it's so challenging is, is not even putting aside that emotional aspect of it. Um, there's some very practical issues. You know, the idea is that, um, you know, people are going to share. Well, everybody plays nice when mom and dad are around. And and maybe siblings aren't going to get on quite as well after mom and dad are gone. So there's, there's that side, but there's the whole family dynamics about that. Are people going to be able to co-own in some shape or form an asset that is of such emotional value? But there's also the really practical things about what if the cabin needs a new roof? Who's going to pay for it? What do you do if one of the children, so let's assume we're just talking about the children, that next generation. What if one of the children is able to use it a lot more than the other? Because one lives here and one lives in a different province, for example. 
What if it's very much a, a family oriented thing, as in young children, one of the siblings has children, the other doesn't. So there's always going to be this inequality unless unless you have children who are identical with their financial situation and their family situation, there are going to be inequities. Somebody's going to use it more than the other. Somebody can afford to pay for it more than the other. Uh, somebody's going to um, use it in a different way from others, the other, and people are going to want to use it for different reasons. A, a really key example of this would be in a family where let's say, let's go, let's say we have Jack and Jill. These are the two kids. Jack lives in Toronto. Jill lives in Vancouver. And so Jack, inevitably cannot use this place as much as Jill. Jack wants to rent it out. Jill says, I don't want strangers sleeping in our beds. Classic example of the kinds of challenges that come up when you start talking about this. Mm -hmm. So what alternatives do you suggest that people consider? And what are some of the tools that you can use to accomplish these? Right, well, I'll talk about a few of the, the alternatives that I've seen in my practice. Uh, one is outright, just leave it to the kids. So mom and dad say, okay, Family cottage goes to Jack and Jill equally. Just leave it to them outright. So that is definitely simple. One of the advantages of that, very straightforward. Um, mom and dad can say, okay, done and dusted, handled. We've given it to the kids. So the challenge of that, of course, is that um, the, each of them then owns, let's say, 50% of this asset, and each of them can then do whatever they want with it. So Jack, in my example, could just turn around and sell it to somebody else. Uh, if anybody would want to be in half ownership with Jill, of course. But it does mean that each of them can do whatever they want with it, including leaving it to somebody else. So Jack, for example, could decide to leave his half of the cottage to his wife. Maybe wife doesn't like Jill, and they simply will cannot agree on anything to do with the co-ownership of this. So that direct ownership is one thing. And there's no guarantee there, if you think about it, that this property will then go to the next generation. When mom and dad were saying, let's leave this in the family, they met the grandchildren too, and hopefully great grandchildren. So you leave a half interest to Jack. He, he's not necessarily going to leave it to his children. He could leave it to somebody else. So there's no guarantee of any kind of legacy when you just leave it to your children like that. And a variation of that is leaving it to Jack and Jill jointly. This is something I've seen often happen. And um, to explain that joint ownership would mean that when one of Jack and Jill dies, the other becomes the 100% owner automatically. So great way of keeping it in the family because it would have to go to Jill if Jack died and vice versa. But how is that a legacy? Then it's all going to end up on one side of the family. And uh, that's not going to carry it on to the next generation. So those are two ways that right off the bat, we tend to say, not a good idea. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. So another variation, leave the cottage or cabin in a trust for your children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. So that allows this sort of succession from generation to generation to generation. But of course, now you're creating a trust, so it's far more complex. And also we have this lovely pesky rule in Canada that every 21 years, the trust is considered to have sold the, the cabin. So if it goes up in value in those 21 years, suddenly there's gonna be a big tax bill if they wanna keep it in the family, in that trust, which of course was the goal. And of course, you also have to figure out in the trust, well, what are the rules? Just because now you have this trust owning the cottage or cabin, does that mean you've fixed all the issues about who's gonna pay for the roof, who gets to stay there at weekends and all that kind of stuff. You'd have to have a lot of detailed rules set out in the trust about the rules of ownership and occupation. But a trust at least does achieve that intergenerational transfer of the property which incidentally is the whole origin of how trust came into existence in the first place. So that's another one. Another one I've seen is that you um, set up kind of like a, it's almost like a country club. The, the cottage goes into, uh, it's actually a society, which is like a club, a golf club or a country club or whatever. And family members are allowed to become members of the club. And you write rules saying that only family members can be members of the club. And you have rules just like you would with a golf club or country club as to how you use the property that you know you you can't be there if you're um if you're drunk <laughs> you can't be there unless you paid your dues you can only use it x number of weeks a year it's very much like the kind of rules you could write as if you were joining um a club such as a, a as a golf club you write the rules as to use and ownership but it's a sorry the society that owns the cottage and the society doesn't die the society will just carry on with members going into the future. So 
I, I know uh, quite a lot of people have tried that structure and, and it works quite well. Disadvantage, of course, is complexity. You've got to set up this thing, this society, this club, and you have to write those rules. Um, so if anybody were tempted to do that, I would say uh, mom and dad should do that. They should do it while they're alive. Don't let it leave it for the children to figure it out. Um, write the rules now and get it all set up while you're still around. So um, another alternative is kind of a bit of a hybrid. And I've often done this. I have said, for example, in a will, the cottage cabin goes to Jack and Jill. Um, and actually, it stays in the estate for Jack and Jill to have and enjoy for three years. If after three years they haven't reached a, a co-ownership agreement and reached a deal on exactly how they're going to share the ownership, who's going to pay for the roof, who's going to stay which days, if they haven't come up with an agreement they're happy with, say, within three years, then it gets sold. So that's giving them the opportunity to work out the rules for themselves uh, without forcing it on them. And there's a, this sort of escape hatch that if they simply can't agree on what that agreement should say, that means they probably shouldn't be owning this property together anyway. So just sell it. So that is something that quite often is kind of the default position that I have seen that families go, we don't love that because there's no guarantee that this will happen, but we are enabling our children to make it happen. So those are the, the main alternatives that I've seen. None of them is simple. None of them is a perfect answer. Yeah, and I don't think this is a topic where you ever are going to get that perfect answer. But I think those are that's a really great overview. Um, you know, the society I, that's not something I've actually ever ever heard before, and it's really really. Would that work if if the property is U.S. based? Yeah, you could probably do an equivalent. You would set up the equivalent of a society, a, a not for profit. It has to be kind of a not for profit kind of organization. I'm sure that they would have equivalents in the U.S. Um, jurisdictions. And then people could join the club just the way you could. You know, Canadians can join a golf club in Arizona. Um, mm -hmm. They could join the club. I have no idea what the tax implications of that would be. But I think that you know membership in a society isn't an asset as such. So it should be a fairly straightforward way to work your way through that and adapt that concept into the U.S. Yeah. Yeah, no, and I, I really like that strategy as well, where you give them three to five years in terms of work it out because it, it's the intent is there, but you don't leave your family in a situation where if it's not working, that they're forced to remain in that. So I think that that's a, a fabulous uh, way yeah. to work. Well, and the difficulty is you start asking these questions of, say, the parents and say, well, what if um, the roof needs a repair? What if Jill can afford it and Jack can't? Like, mm -hmm. how do you resolve these issues? And you go through the list of all the things that could come up. And for any of anybody listening who, who has a family place, you, know, you could come up with a long list of the kinds of issues that can arise. Are we going to allow tenants? Are we going to allow friends and family? Who gets Christmas? Who gets the prime uh, weeks of the year, whether it's if Whistler it would be in the winter, um, Kelowna or Salt Spring will be the summer. Who gets and how do you decide those things? You come up with a whole list of these issues that can arise. And, you know, who, who pays the heat? Is it 50-50? If one of you is using it 75% of the time, the other's 25%. You write all of those and you start going through them with people. And most of the time they'll go, oh, hadn't thought of that. Hadn't mm -hmm. thought of that. Hadn't thought of that. And then I say, well, do you think your children could agree on all of those things? Yeah. And that's the test, you know? And, and sometimes there are very cohesive families and they say, yeah, Jack and Jill will be fine. They'll work it out. Um, and then you say, okay, fast forward. Next generation, Jill's got six children, Jack's got one. Now what? Mm -hmm. So, so long as you can think ahead like that, and in the very cynical world I live in, you think of all the bad things that could happen. If you can come up with all of those and come up with the answers, you can make it work. Yeah, head them off at the gaps. Yeah. So, if we take the challenges that you've laid out, you know, the, the options and alternatives that, that we've spoken about, when you meet with clients, what's your typical advice and what direction do you typically steer them towards? Do you want me to give the honest answer? or the we like honesty. Honest is good. <laughs> I, I have to say that I, I my typical advice is you're going to have to sell it. You, you know, either you sell it while the property while you're alive or you specify in your will that it must be sold. Do not put all of this work and all this onus and burden on your children. And if if they feel that that, that is just a, I mean, the first reaction to that tends to be, that is the opposite of what we said we wanted. Yeah. Uh, you know, you sort of say, well, 
the legacy you might be leaving if you don't do that is that your children will grow to hate one another or at least they'll not be talking to one another. Is that a legacy that you would prefer? And if one of your children really wants to keep this property in the family, but perhaps it's just that child's family and that child can go and buy it, could buy it from your estate. But trying to force children or grandchildren to get on with another, it's something that is so emotional and so important to everybody, in my view, is a recipe for a disaster in the family. Mm -hmm. So my, my, my recommendation is it's always greeted with horror and it's not a popular answer. Um, but I'd have to say that probably nine out of 10 times, eventually when they get past the being annoyed with me and the emotional reaction is, yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think it's obviously a very family specific matter in terms of what are the family dynamics and relationships. Uh, but of course, even once you get past that next generation, you don't know what the dynamics are, the generation after, right? So. Well, and, and it also it's interesting because some, it does also depend on the history of the property. If this is like a first generation property that mom and dad have bought, um, that is typically comes to be the right answer. But what if mom and dad themselves, it's like they are already the third generation of owning it. Then it's it, then it's different because it's already been a legacy property, and they've and and also their answer to me then will be, well, we've done just fine. So what's your problem? Because mm -hmm. um, we've made it to three generations, and so if it's got the if it's already got that long family legacy, then I really do think, okay, let's roll up our sleeves and try and come up with a solution to keep it that way. But if it's just something mom and dad bought, and they have this dream of what it should be like in three generations' time, it's a different conversation. Yeah. I think the history of the, the property and what it actually means um, does make a difference. And I also challenge parents to say to their kids, we assume this means a lot to you. We assume that this is very important. We assume you would want this to be a legacy. Do you, how do you actually feel? It's astonishing how many parents do not actually ask their children whether they want it. Mm -hmm. through all these machinations and all this angst because the parents assume that that's what their children want. But so very often you ask the question, they go, we don't care, we'd rather have the money. Mm -hmm. Parents don't want to hear that, so children won't necessarily tell them that. But if everybody were being honest in this conversation, that is sometimes what the answer would be. We, we actually don't want it, it's too much work. And if you give it to us, we'll feel obligated to keep it. We'll feel obligated to go through all of these uh, difficulties and, and financial expense of maintaining a second property because we feel we have to honor your memory, but actually we don't want it. So I think honesty, transparency, and actually having the conversation. It's got nothing to do with law, <laughs> nothing to do with finances. It's just family dynamics. Basic good communication. Absolutely. Works in a number of situations, I'm sure. Yeah. Any other questions on your side? I think fantastic. I think that uh, is a great That's place to, to lead things off. I think you've given us a great overview of so many things to think about for any clients, uh, you know, that are going through this right now, questions to ask, conversations to have. So I think that that was a really, really great overview. And uh, for anyone who'd like to follow up, uh, Kathy and I are certainly here to uh, to address questions. And Sally's been a fantastic resource to us. Sagerandcrow.com. Mm -hmm. Feel free to log in. <laughs> and uh, definitely, if you have haven't seen Sally's first visit with us it's well worth logging in for that and if you have any other questions if you have topics you'd like to see us address with other experts we would be more than happy to hear from you and so give us a call or log into the website sagerandcrow.com and thank you again Sally I appreciate your time that was lovely and uh, I'm sure we'll come up with another topic for you you'll be <laughs> our reoccurring guest star so well, thank absolutely you. my pleasure. I hope you found it helpful, everybody. Thank you. Thank Incredibly you. helpful. Thank you very much, Sally, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.